All right. All right. Well, last week we covered one through six by the grace of God in Romans 11. And we talked about, you know, God has not rejected his chosen people with whom he foreknew. That's in uh, verse two. And so I shared with you, um, because here in chapters one, we went through Romans one through eight. And here Paul's talking to, and he, and we remember he's not in Rome. He's not at the church with these people. He's literally pinning this down. And so what he's doing is he's, he's want, wanting them to understand where his heart is for his own people and for the Gentiles. And so we went through one through eight, and then we come to nine, 10, and 11. And what is that? All of a sudden now Paul's heart again goes back to his countrymen. It goes back to his people, to the Jews. And what, it, what he's doing is he's saying, I want you to understand, even though I'm talking to everyone, I want to talk to you. It's like you would talk to your own family. You know, if you were writing a letter to a large area of people, but yet your people lived in that area and your heart would kind of focus in. And that's what he does through chapters 9, 10, and 11. And it talks to us too through the Spirit of God is it talks about their past in chapter 9, their, where they were at the present in chapter 10, and now we're in chapter 11. And what this is doing is Paul is sharing with them is not only what's going on, but the future for these people. And he's wanting them to know that you do have a hope. Amen. You do have a hope. And Paul is really moving this forward. And um, I, th I think there um, in those first few verses here in chapter 11, because, you know, a lot of times, and we read this where Elijah is, and I shared with you guys, it's really unique how when the Lord tells me, okay, Pat, this is where I want you to go in this study. Like we're studying Elijah, the life of Elijah, but we're kind of coming in the back door that way. And we're studying, and as I was sharing with the class, is that, you know, when Elijah came on the scene, he, he went right ahead and walked right up to Ahab. Now, this gentleman, again, I keep, I, I've, been, I've trained myself to call every man a gentleman. He was not a gentleman, but he was an evil king, and he was an evil king from the very beginning. And so then we, we studied that, you know, Jezebel came on the scene. So now you've got two power-packed evils coming together. And, and we talked about that Elijah came up against that. And, but yet, before he comes, before it even shows, and, and the first uh, reference of him coming on the scene, what it does is it tells us that he had been with God. And because he had been with God, just like when you're with God, you know the heart of God. You know what he's wanted. He puts something in you. He shares with you his desires. He's sharing with you even today when you spend time with him, what he's wanting precisely for you. And so when Elijah came on the scene, he knew what was in God's heart. And he went right before the evil. And he said, until I say, there will be no dew nor rain. And then the scripture says, and then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. See, your Lord, your God, any time that you spend time with him, he's going to put in your heart what to do. And you're going to know what to do. And when, when Paul here is talking to them and he's sharing with them, he's reminding them again, look what happened to Elijah. Because Elijah goes, I and I alone am the only prophet left for you, God. I, I'm it. I, here I am. And God reminds Elijah, that's not true. It's not true. I myself have reserved 7,000. <laughs> and then Obadiah, he had saved a hundred and he had taken care of them. They were in two caves, 50 each, and he'd taken water and bread, you know. So he goes, you're, you're not the only dude. <laughs> I got plenty others. And so, so we, we saw how Paul is bringing to their attention that even in the old covenant, which you covet so much, I'm wanting you to see that even then, trying to do something on your own is not where it works. Amen? Yeah. 
All right, so let's start. It. And he tells him, he says in, uh, in, in uh, verse 5, he says, he talks to them that he has a remnant. See, God has always had a remnant. Amen. He will always have a remnant. And you know, the remnants get pretty large at times. Would you say 7,000 is pretty good? Yeah. Compared to Obadiah's 100? But God still takes care of it. Amen. And from that remnant comes the mighty move of God. It's just like where we are here in America. We might be a remnant, but our remnant is growing. Amen. It's growing. Why? Because God is in that movement. And see, you cannot stop the move of God. We, and, and so Paul here is sharing with his people is that, look, this is what took place. I preach the gospel of Christ Jesus, the ones whom you crucified. And then he goes on to tell him, he said, look, I understand I am a Jew. And he talks about all the things that he did. And now let's look in verse 7. It says, what then? Israel failed to obtain what, and I'm reading from the Amplified today, what is seeking, that is God's favor by obedience to the law. But the elect, those chosen few, obtain it, obtained it. While the rest of them were hardened and calloused and indifferent. Just as it is written in Scripture, God has given them a spirit of stupor or spirit of slumber, eyes that do not see, nor ears that do not hear. It's a spiritual apathy that continues on them to this very day. And in verse 7, and now that was in Isaiah. Now in verse 9, it talks about David. So, so here, Paul is reminding them of the people that they know the most, the people they preach the most, the people that they read from the Torah the most. It says, and David, let their tables of abundance become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribute to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and their backs be bent under the burden forever. So I say, have they stumbled so far to a spiritual ruins? Certainly not. But by their transgressions, their rejection of the Messiah, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous when they realize what they have forfeited. But if Israel's transgressions mean riches for the world at large and their failure means riches for the Gentile, how much more will their fulfillment and reinstatement be? So Paul is saying, once you get a hold of this, how powerful are you going to be? And then he goes on, he says, but now I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. And so Paul is saying now, he's saying, now look, and we've talked about that Paul had to stay in his lane, right? He really wanted to go minister to the Jews. And one of the things I'm going to be reminding you as we go through today is that you want to remember to stay in your lane. What is your lane? The lane that the Lord has called for you. But see, Paul wanted so much to minister to the Jews. He, every time he would go into any city, the first place he would go is to the synagogue. Why? That's where my people are. See, and so, and so the Lord had to really critique him. He had to bring correction. And Paul, you know, and so Paul here in the end was saying, hey, look, I know who I'm called to now. And so now what I've done, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, so you will probably have to go back on YouTube and get it, but I'm just going to go through some of the prophecies. I've only listed 10. Um, because a lot of people with, when we would read that, if you just read that scripture and that was, your, that was your Bible study for the day, you might think, well, that's kind of hard. God gives them a spirit of stupor and, you know, their eyes are closed and, you know, what's going on here, God? But one of the things I want to show you that as the Jews, they always went by prophecy. So here we see that the prophecies of Jesus move forward in the fact that Jesus would be born of a, of, of a virgin woman, Gen, uh, Genesis 3.15, Matthew 1.20, and, and uh, Galatians 4.4. 4. Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Um, that's in Matthew 2.1, Luke 2.4-6. And Malachi 5, 2. The Messiah would be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14, Matthew 1, 22, 23, and Luke 1, uh, 1 26 through 
31. The Messiah would come from the line of Abraham, Genesis 12, 3. Genesis 22, 18, Matthew 1, 1, Romans 9, 5. The Messiah would be the descendant of Isaac. Genesis 17, 19, Genesis 21, 12, Luke 3, uh, 334. He would be a descendant of Jacob. And it just goes on and on and on. And the scriptures don't stop there. So my point here is um, a lot of times people will say, but the Jews can't believe. And see, that's not true. And so, so here in verse 7, it says, What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking for. That is God's favor. See, Israel, the whole nation of Israel that believed in God was seeking the favor of God. And they, had, they thought they had to receive it by obeying the law. But the elect, the chosen, and I talked to you guys uh, last week about the election, and who are the election? Who are the elect? The elect are the people that actually have accepted God's way of receiving the Messiah. See, the Jews thought it was their ways through the law, but God sent his only son. And through his only son is the only way that God says now that you can become a true Israel. You can become a true Jew. You can become a true believer. One way and one way only. Amen? And so we see that there has to be that election. And I talked to you guys about the fact of the chosen, you know, that God foreknew. And so how is it that God foreknows? Well, he knows the beginning, the middle, and the end. So he knows the end at the beginning. So does he know the people that are going to accept him? Amen. Yes. Okay. So when, it, when you see in Scripture where it says he foreknew, stop a moment and look at that. Because it gives you, it really should bring you rest to know, oh, thank you, God, that he's prepared for you everything that you need. Amen. Why? Because he foreknows. Amen. Okay. And then we saw also, because here in John 15, 16, it says, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. See, God has chosen everyone. And so when he came to Israel first, he wanted them to choose him. But because they didn't, God said, well, then I'll turn to the Gentiles. What did he do? He went into the highways, into the byways. That was us. Amen. 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 And then in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord does not wish that anyone would perish, but that all would come into repentance. Amen. But see, what, what Paul knew in his heart was that they were choosing, they were choosing um, their old ways rather than listening to what God had promised them for the new covenant. And so they were still relying upon their works, what they could do, how they could do it. How long can I do it? How loud can I pray? Going to the wall. How loud can I pray, Lord? I am so much better than this man below me. How? It's like, what? You know, so, so what Paul is really sharing with them, this has nothing to do with your works. Because you and I both know, as Jews, that we were never, ever able to keep the law. And if you still think you can, it's all in your mind. Paul is really kind of messing with them a little bit. And he says, and so again, now turn with me to, uh, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. I want to show you something there. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. And again, I'm going to be reading now the Amplified. But we should and are morally obligated as debtors always to give thanks to God for you. Believers, beloved by the Lord, because he has chosen you from the beginning. From the beginning. Hallelujah. For salvation through the sanctifying works of the Spirit. See, it's not by what you do or how you do it. It is through the Spirit of God that did it. 
Aren't we thankful? Amen. Because if, you know, the things that we would really strive to do and maybe we would get a little better at doing it, maybe you don't pray particularly correct. You know, say, honey, why don't you pray? Or sir, why don't you? I don't, re I don't really know how to do that. Well, that's okay. You know why? Because the Spirit of God in you knows how to pray. And it does, you know, and we should work and study and renew our mind so that we can pray the word. So if you're ever at a loss for words to pray, just go pick up the Bible, pray the word of God. Amen. Amen. So he was telling them, look, you're not accepted. You're not accepted by your words, but you're accepted by your faith and what Jesus Christ did. And he says, it's not by works of the law. It's not by your self-righteousness. It's not by how much you can do or don't do. Because a lot of times, you know, we think, well, I, I should have done this. And then you go do this. Like, for instance, you go pray for an hour and you study the word for an hour and you get done. Then all of a sudden you hear the enemy say, you know, you really should have studied a little longer. <laughs> Well, maybe you should have. But see, with God, God doesn't condemn you with that. Amen. Why? Because there is now no... <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, I love my church. <laughs> All right, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. I'm going to go to verse 4. And, but, and you stay there. I'm just going to read verse 8 of Romans there. It says, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that uh, do not see and ears that do not hear. And even to this very day, and this is talking about in Isaiah 29.10, and this is where Paul was actually quoting this. But what I wanted to show you here in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, For the God of this world has blinded their minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see. The light of the gospel. See, it's very precise. See, this covering that they have, it's very precise. That they might not see the light of the gospel that, that displays the glory of Christ, who is the very image of God. And so, you know, if you talk to a Jew, that they, they, some of them, they just don't believe that Jesus is the very image of God. So, you know, if you ever witness to someone, put a star here because this is going to be one of those verses that you can come back to and you can say, look, look, the end, we live in a fallen world. When Adam did what he did, we now live in a fallen world. But you have to choose Christ. This is the way the Lord chose to do it. The unbeliever chooses to not believe first. They choose. And then when they choose not to believe, now I don't see. And then once I don't see what's been, what's been covered from me, it's the gospel. It's that glory of what God did through Christ Jesus. So see, God knows. And when he, Paul was talking here in 2 Corinthians, he knows that. He says, look, this is what you're hidden. This is what's hidden from you. So when you're talking to people, as I know you're doing, that when you walk out the doors and you go minister to people, don't be surprised that they just don't get it, okay? Well, because, you know, some of us were so blessed to have actually been born into a believing family, so we're reared up and raised up under the love of God. But, you know, you may have different people marry into your families or whatever, they may not understand you. They may look at you and just go, you're just weird. <laughs> and I always say, but in a good way. Because I do have people tell me I'm weird. I'm like, oh, okay, I got it. But in a good way. Because <laughs> Jesus is my good. <laughs> All right, now turn with me to Romans 9. And we've discussed this chapter, but I want to go back here and I want to show you what Paul was reiterating to them. 9 verse 31. It says, what shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, who did not seek salvation and the right relationship with God, nevertheless, they obtained righteousness, that is the righteousness of God, which is produced by faith. See, even though the Gentiles received this blessing, they too still had to believe. 
It's not like God went in there and made them believe. Like God's going to go to the Jews and go make them believe. No, everyone has the right to choose. And 31, it says, whereas Israel, and this is talking about the Jewish nation, the, G the godly Jews there, uh, always pursuing the law of righteousness, they did not succeed in fulfilling the law. Now, isn't that amazing? And so Paul's telling them here, look, you and I both know we did not make it when it came to fulfilling the law. We broke laws. We, we all know that. And then he goes, and why not? Because it was not by faith that they pursued it, but as though it were of works relating to the merit of their own works instead of their faith. It says, they stumbled over the stumbling stone, Jesus Christ, as it was written forever, forever remains. Behold, I am laying a, a stone in Zion of stumbling, a rock of offense. And, you know, as, as we look at that, it says, and he who believes in him, whoever adheres to trust in and relies upon him will not be disappointed in his expectations. And, you know, some of you guys, I know you really like to minister in, in um, maybe street evangelism, uh, evangelism, you know, one-on-one. -on -one. You may not say, well, I don't want to necessarily go on the street, but maybe I'll evangelize and talk to the people that I work with, things like that. And uh, I was listening to an interview last week, and this lady, uh, she lived in New York City, and she witnessed in the very downtown the squares of New York City, and she did it for years. And she said, she said, you know, I was, I was able to minister to Muslims, to the Hindus, uh, to Buddhists. She said, and not everyone accepted Christ, that's true, but they were easier to talk to. The ones that were the hardest was the Jews. But what she was saying, because I listened, because I thought, well, let me see where this is going. Because, see, Jews can be saved. And she said, but it's not impossible. Right. See, and so um, I did a little bit of a research, and, and um, I went back to probably from before the Holocaust, but right now, the Jews, now I'm talking about the Messianic Jews, people that act Jews that actually believe in Christ. There's 15 million that live in Israel. See, we tend to, look, we're not there, right? Out of sight, out of mind. Maybe we don't study, maybe we don't know. But even in America, there's 350 million. Wow. Whoa. When I was studying this, I just went, oh, Lord, this is awesome. And honestly, I could just see Jesus in that white. I could just see him kind of twirling. He loves those people. He went there first for those people. It's like if I came here and all of you were my family and I came here, but you all rejected me. Well, then I turn from here because right over here is another group and they all receive me. But it doesn't mean that I don't love you. Amen. See, that's his heart. And so here I was like, Lord, you know, you're just so good. Because um, when I heard Paul talk, you know, he goes, look, I'm a Jew of all Jews. But I am a believer in Christ. Amen. So if you say Jews can't be saved, well, well, what do we do with Paul? <laughs> and what do we do with all the disciples? Maybe not all of them. But most of them. What do we do with them? And what do we do with the 3,000 that got born again at the beginning of the church? Okay, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 3.12. 2 Corinthians 3.12. And, and I want you to start this scripture here because this is something else that a lot of people think that, you know, okay, we just have to be careful how we read this. 2 Corinthians 3.12. Therefore... Since we have such a hope, say, I have a hope. I have a hope. Okay. We use great boldness of speech. So see, what I'm about to tell you, I tell you with great boldness. Why? Because this is the truth of the Word of God. Amen. He goes on, he says, unlike Moses, again, this is Paul, <laughs> unlike Moses, 
who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. Paul's putting this very, he's coming to a very big point here. He said, but their minds were blinded. Until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament. Because the veil is taken away in, is because the veil is taken away in Christ. What was Paul saying there? Even to this day, you won't believe. Even when we open up the scriptures, even when you come to just using the Torah, when we even read about Christ, even to this day, you choose to turn your head and to not believe that Christ was the Messiah. And so now let's look what he says. He says, but even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies over your heart. But look at verse 16. This is the one I want you to remember. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. See, it's not impossible for the Jews to believe. And this is something the Lord's really putting in my heart. Look. The Jews are coming back in. They've been coming a little at a little at a little at a little. And then pretty soon it's like, whoa, it's just like you believers. We were kind of down and nobody, one ever, no, you know, up till here lately, most people couldn't have told if we were a Christian from a man in the moon. Most, most, you know, if you worked at a place, did they really know you were a Christian? Well, I was a Christian. Yeah, they knew. Okay, but did you talk with anyone? Did you witness to anyone? Did you pray for anyone? You know, I'm saying, did you, were, were you the church out there? Why? Because, see, that's our job. Amen. And that's what God puts in us to go do. Yeah. Amen. Amen or oh me. Amen. Amen. Verse 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. See, and, and, and this, is what we, this is what we tell our Jewish friends. You say, well, Pastor, I don't really know any Jews. That's okay. You know a lot of heathen. You know, anybody in here know any heathens? <laughs> okay. People that aren't saved. We all know them. And the thing of it is, is the Lord saying, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, do you have the Spirit of the Lord in you? Yes. So when you go to that person now, the Spirit of the Lord is there. Amen. And now you've got the Spirit of the Lord, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen. There's freedom to speak His Word, freedom to, to pray over somebody, you know, whatever that may be. There's freedom to go do that. But we all, with unveiled face, behold and see our face must be unveiled. We must choose to turn. And that word turn means to change your direction. See, we all have the choice to accept Christ. We choose to turn. And you can turn this way in anything that's in your life. You know, you may be a person that you've been raised a certain way and you've got all these ideas and you're having to work through the, all these ideas. Well, look, when you come through an idea that you know that is not godly, just turn from it and say, Lord, I repent that I even believe that way. I'm choosing to believe you. And you start from there and move forward. Yeah. And, you know, um, I, you really have to do this daily. This is not something you can just wake up one morning and say, oh, I've got it all figured out. You know, you might have it figured out in which way you're going to go, but you go there one step at the time. Well, even one minute of the day at the time. Amen? Amen? And it says, being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now I'm back to Romans 11, verses 9 and 10. And David said, let their table, their abundance, be a snare, a stumbling block, and let their eyes be darkened that they may not see, and their backs be bent over forever. And we see this also in Psalms. This is where Paul was quoting from in Psalm 69, 22. And what was David doing there? Because a lot of times I looked at the, some of the things that David were saying, and I thought, man, he just has a really bad attitude toward these people. But then as I studied more and more, I saw that David was actually prophesying 
the coming of Christ, and then he would prophesy what he would see in the Spirit. And here, that's exactly what David is doing. So when we see that it was, it was the rejection of the Jews that caused this to be brought, it wasn't something that the Lord just put on them. This is something they made a decision. They chose, just like you chose. And so in Deuteronomy, it says, uh, verse, uh, chapter 30, verse 19, God says, and this is a really, really good, um, I just, I like this because it tells you exactly where, what God is requiring of you. He says, I set before you this day. See, there's your choice. See, so many people think, well, I just don't, you know, and, and this thing about the sovereignty of God, well, you know, if it's God's will, it's just going to take place. Look, God has given you a will, and he will not choose for you. Do you understand me, church? God gives you the right to see what's right and wrong. And we've talked about, we've talked about this a lot about in Romans 1, remember when we were going through Romans 1, how that we can suppress the truth. I talked to you about it's like a beach ball. You're trying to push that thing under the water. It's really hard to push down the truth of God. But pretty soon you can do it. And so when I got here to this, I thought, see, a lot of people think for the Jews, they don't even have a choice. Now, they have a choice. They have a free will just like you and I. But if they choose not to believe, then God puts this slumber on them. And, And it's not, you know, and if you talk to anybody in the world that doesn't believe in Christ, that, oh, I don't believe in God. Now, we talked about that. We know that everybody knows there's a God. Now, whether or not you want to believe in him is your choice, but everybody, Romans 1, 18 through 20, right? It tells us right there. You know that there's a God. You know that there's a Father, Son, and a Holy Spirit. We, we all know that. Why? It says because God put that in your heart, but you have the right to suppress it at your choice. But see, here Paul is saying, look, you know, it is your choice. And God gave us, even in Deuteronomy, you know, and if you think about that, why would he use that? Because that's in the Torah. You know, so when you're talking to your family and to your friends, talk to them about where they are. Because, see, they need to hear a word for where they are. So, In other words, what are you talking about, Pastor? Find out where they are, not where you're wanting them to be. Remember, we've talked about the door. Remember, if, if they open the door, allow it to be open. And so find out, and it takes a lot of listening, right? Two ears, one mouth. It takes a lot of listening. And find out where they are. And if they open that door, give the word. They start to close the door, let them close it. Don't put your foot in there, right? Don't put your, in other words, don't try to do it on your own. Don't try to do it through your works. Let the Holy Spirit do his job. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 10. Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to go on to verse 11. Well, no, let me, this thing about where he's talking about bowing down their backs, you know, because that's talking about burdens. It was talking about, and that's what was prophesied over them. But the good news for you and I is Jesus said in uh, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me. All of you that are weary and heavily burdened with religious rituals that provide no peace, and I will give you rest. See, Jesus loved his people. He came to them first. But he's, what Paul is saying that, that is that because you turn from that, he turned to the Jews. And then if you'll look in verse 11, he, Paul's saying, okay, what do we say then? What do we say? They have, stumb- have they stumbled so far as to fall to spiritual ruins? Absolutely not. But by their transgressions, their rejection of the Messiah, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel jealous. Now, Israel, a lot of people think that's all of Israel and, you know, all of Israel will be saved. It's meaning, Israel, we covered this a few weeks back talks about Israel is actually the person that chooses to accept Christ Jesus as Lord. That is the true Israel. And so then Paul goes on here and he says, now 
And now, if Israel's transgressions means riches for the world at large and their failure means riches to the Gentiles, how much more will their fulfillment be when they're reinstated? In other words, when, how much... And, and I just started meditating on this. And then Paul goes on and he says, look, I speak to you Gentiles because I am a minister to the Gentiles. I'm like, yay, Paul. <laughs> he got it. you Because we as the Gentiles needed that. We needed that leading yeah. that Paul had that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah. It's still ministering to me and you today. And so uh, what I saw was that, and then in verse 11, he says, no, because, you know, you may be here today and you may think, you know, I've, I've stumbled in some areas, pastor. Well, hello, join the crowd. Okay. Because it's a crowd because we've all stumbled. But what the Lord is saying is that they've stumbled, but they've not fully fallen. Why? Because of his grace, because of his mercy. And it's the same thing for you. You may think, you know, I've fallen so far down. I just, you know, I'm here, but that's it. I'm just here. But see, the Lord would say, okay, I'll take that. I'll take you. He's so merciful. Yeah. And he wants you. You know, so many of us think we got to clean ourselves up before we can even go back and talk to the Lord. The Lord would say, just come here. Yeah, just come. I love you. See, there is nothing that we can do that can make God not love us. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how long you've been there. I don't care if you did it on purpose. I don't care if you're still doing it. That sin will not separate you from the love of God. Now, it will affect you because it'll have consequences for you, but it will not separate you from the love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And so we must remember. And so as Paul was saying here, absolutely not. They've stumbled and they stumbled over the stumbling stone, but they will, they will get back up. And so I want to encourage you to pray for the Jewish nation. Pray, church, for the Jewish nation. Because um, Genesis 12, 3 says, God says, I'll bless those that bless you, and I'll curse those that curse you. What is that? Who's the you in there? Oh, that was Israel back then. Back then, this scripture's been fulfilled. This scripture, I will bless those that bless now the new Israel. <coughs> That's you. Whoa. So now we want to bless Israel because God has blessed us. We want to pray for them. You know why the enemies, the, you're not going to hear a lot about this on news unless you really look for it. Because see, the enemy does not want Israel to come back up. Because as Israel's coming up, the new Jerusalem is coming down. It is. It is. And so, you know, and, and the thing of it is, see, we're right there with them. But when he's talking about all the things that, because you're, he's saying, look, all of my people, they're going to be jealous because they're going to look at you and go, I want you what you have. How do you, how, how do you stand the way you always do? How do you just like believe when there's no hope? Oh, no, with us, there's always hope. Yeah. <laughs> our, our God is so good. He's just so good. He's so good. So I want to leave you with this, is that we've been accepted, not by our works, but by his. We've been, we've been healed, not by our stripes, but by his. And no war, weapon formed against us shall prosper, because all of it went toward him, and he prospered. We've been adopted and made heirs to the king. He's given us all of his authority. We are blessed at all that we set our hands to. 
And we will never die. Amen. Think about that. I mean, all the things that we've got, but we will never die. Why? Because Christ died. Now you're the new creation, spirit, soul, and body. Your spirit and soul, when that physical tent falls down, guess what? The real you rises up. <laughs> Hallelujah, Lord. Glory be to God. God is the only one that gives me good and perfect gifts. God doesn't give you anything that's not good or perfect. If it's good, it's from God. If it's perfect, it's from God. Nothing will ever separate us from the love of God. He is faithful. Grace has chosen you. Now you choose grace. If you've chosen grace, you've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, did you receive today, church? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.